Welcome to another episode of Beneath the Surface, a series where curators of the Australian National Maritime Museum and their guests talk about interesting topics and events. My name is Ron Leikauf. I'm the curator of post-war immigration at the Australian National Maritime Museum, and I will chair today's session. The title for our talk is Ships Plans and Planning Ships. We want to explore an area that can look arcane and intimidating to the uninitiated. What are ship's plans, really? How are they created? And what can we use them for? Our guest and speaker for this talk is David Payne. David has been an essential honorary research associate of the Australian National Maritime Museum since retiring in 2020. Previously, he had been a consultant to the museum since 1988 and then joined the staff at the Curator Historic Vessels in late 2004. David has an extensive background in yacht design and boat design with a wide experience as a vessel draughtsman and designer. And he documented many of the historic craft of the museum, including preparing plans to assist with restoration and reconstruction efforts. Now, before I begin with the talk, I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Yoruba Nation as the traditional custodians of the Bamal, Earth, and Badu waters on which we work and on which this talk takes place. I also want to acknowledge all traditional custodians of the land and waters throughout Australia and pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, before we begin, some housekeeping. We have reserved about 30 minutes um, for this talk and 20 minutes for questions from you. If you want to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A function by using the Q&A button in your Zoom menu. I will then either, if I can, answer the question directly or better, pose it to David at the end of this presentation. The talk is recorded and will be made available to the general public after it is finished. David, thank you for being here and thank you for agreeing to cover this exciting topic. Um, now, my first question would be, I think that most of us, what most of us want to know is whether ship, ship's plan really contains and what it does not contain. So some of our listeners, for instance, might have a boat of their own and some might just be interested in a specific vessel and have access to their plans and want to learn more about them. And the museum's Vaughan Evans Library, for instance, has a collection of physical ship's plans for visitors to view. So what can you learn from reading a ship's plan? Well, thank you, Roland. And um, thank you, everyone who's joined in today. Um, this is going to be an interesting time. I've spent a lot of time drawing plans, but I've never had to really explain to people how it is I've come up with all of them. And there's, yeah thousands of plans and drawings out there I suspect that I've been involved with when I think about it. But so I've thought about how, what's an easy way to get into this. And I've put up a plan there of a boat called Kathleen that's in the museum's collection. It's a drawing I did. You can actually see my thumbprints on it if you look closely. So it's drawn in pencil and I'm very proud of that because um, it shows you know, I was involved in this plan for a long, long time. But I think a good way to get around the issue almost straight away of, of a plan being something that seems inaccessible is think of it as a picture. A picture is something everyone can understand. They can look at it and it tells something. It shows something. Well, a plan is a picture of a boat or part of a boat or a specific um, angle at looking at the boat. And that's plan, that story, that picture that picture tells a story, and of course, the story has a lot of words to it. And the story can be a lot of things. The story can be, what does the boat look like? How's it built? How's it arranged? How's it laid out? What's in there? And how will it be used? And all those questions can be answered on this drawing of Kathleen and another drawing I'll pull up at the end, which shows a different view of it. But we've got three different pictures there that we're looking at on the one plan. The top one is a looking sideways into the boat from the middle of the boat. The plan that's underneath that is looking directly down on the boat, but without the deck 
So it's everything that's under the deck. And then the little drawing on the side, this one here, is a cross section taken basically through the middle of the boat at this point. I'll go back at this point here. So those three drawings together, three-dimensionally, show you actually what the boat is. And I guess that's one of the problems with looking at plans. Designers know how to turn that two-dimensional view into the three-dimensional shape in their head. So when we're looking at this drawing, we can see various things that are shown there and know that they're further back in the boat or they continue behind the boat, like some of this structure here, which is showing where all the framing is on the boat. That's this line through here, the framing. This big part of the boat here, this V, this Y, whatever you want to call it, is actually this, looking at it sideways. And that's a major part of holding the boat together. So the plan's telling you how this boat is built. It's built with these pieces here on the center line. There's a large lump here that's got a little diagonal lines across it there. That's a drafting convention to show that it's going to be a piece of metal and it's a piece of lead. It's the ballast, the ballast that's holding the boat up, right? So you've got those center line pieces and then behind it, you've got all the structure that's building the boat around, all this shell, frames, things we call stringers that are long pieces that go all the way from either end to either end. They keep the frames in place and pull it together. And then the planking, which is a very light line here, is attached to that on the outside. And those three pieces, when they're all fastened together, give you a very strong structure. We would call that the shell of the boat. The shell of the boat made up of the frames, the pieces that are running from the bow to the stern, and the planking. And then they're connected either side by these pieces called the floor. But also on the middle, you've got a mast. There's the mast there looking down on it, but there's the mast looking sideways. And this boat has two masts. So the second one at the back of the boat, and the stern is here, and that little dot there is that. When we look down on this plan, we start to understand, well, what's going on inside the boat? And that's the story of this boat. It was created to sail around the world, but it was also created as a boat that the owner could live on. The owner was an artist called Jack Earl. His wife was Kathleen, otherwise known as Kath. And I knew them from the day I was born. It was one of those family connections that I was lucky to have. So I knew about this boat from a long, long time ago before it ever came to me to draw a plan of it. And I knew Jack, so I could go and talk to Jack about how it might have been laid out. And he showed me pictures and, and talked to a lot, a lot about it so that I could help create the actual plan here of how it was laid out. There's berths when we look down on it. That's where they slept, two berths there. Another two here for the kids, had two children. And another berth here for someone else. And when they sailed around the world, then they had these two berths plus the other three for the, all five of them. So they had their individual berth. And the crew that sailed around the world wasn't actually the family. But to sail around the world, they needed a chart table. They needed a galley. That's what the kitchen's called on a boat. So we had a galley, and that's shown here in this area of the boat. And then because they were on the boat and they had to keep clean, they actually had a bath. That's this outline here, and it's dotted in there. They had a bath they could sit up in and pour a bucket of water over themselves. So this plan's already telling us a lot. It's telling us how the boat was built, why it was so strong. It's also telling us how the boat was actually laid out and arranged and how they used it. The toilet's up here, the head it's called on a boat. That's it drawn sideways there. There's a winch on top at the deck and it leads the anchor chain down here so that you could pull up the anchor, which went out on a roller that's behind here. There's compartments. These are all under this long settee. So you can see them, the little hatches to get into them. And the settee, which had this beautiful purple cushions on it, that's drawn in there too. 
there's a ladder way here, what we call a companion way when you look down on it, a series of steps sideways. That's from getting from here, which is the cabin sole that you stand on, up to the deck and then down into the cockpit. At the back of the boat, you've got the rudder and the tiller that the helmsman would hold onto it to steer by. Within the boat, you've actually got the engine. That's just dotted in here and the engine with its shaft going back to the propeller. All these things are shown on these plans. My drawing's got a lot of information on it. There are drawings that we'll look at a little bit later on where we only look at some of the construction part of it. That's the main focus of it, other bits of it. But that's, that's what we've got. We've been able to show how it's arranged. We've been able to show how the structure is kept separate from some of the parts of the boat that are what we call fit out. The structure in here, the cabin fit out for the hatches, the berths, the settees, the bath, all those things. There's another ladder way up here through a hatch to get out onto the deck up forward. And there's a raised part here to give you enough headroom to stand in. That's called the cabin. When you look down on the boat with the deck, you can see the winch. You can see where the rollers are for that cable and the chain to go over for the anchor to go up and down. You can see the hatchway that that, cabin, that companion way forward came up the hatchway where you came up from the back of the boat to get out, you can see the cockpit and you can see the tiller. The two masts are there and there. This is where the shrouds that hold up the mast are attached. It's got a very, very long bowsprit and these are the lines that are holding that in position. And drawing a plan helps you put all these things in place and helps you decide where structure is going to go. So once you've worked out approximately where you've got a, a bulkhead going to go, it'll help you develop the remains of the, the drawing for the, 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 um, the structure. So there's a lot to show in a plan. And the story of how this boat sailed around the world is it ended up in that plan, how they worked out where the berths were going to be so that you could be comfortable while you're at sea, where the other crew berths were going to be, where the galley was so that they could cook look after themselves, where they could sit and where they could have a bath. And then with the deck plan, the story of how the deck was laid out is shown there too. And you said that we can see your thumbprints on the plan. So it it's a vigorous activity drawing a plan, I guess. But I think when I look at this very detailed drawing, you had access to the person who lost was responsible for building the boat. You were able to look at it. You saw pictures. But it's very hard to read from that if you're not an expert how you did it. So what, what are the tools that you need to draw a plan like that? And uh, what would interest me is, can you do it like out at the boat or on the boat? Or do you just have to do sketches and then go back to your drawing room and um, uh, get out to it? Or can you, as you said, do it out, out of your mind when, you saw, when you've seen it? How do you draw a plan is the, the, the real question that's coming through here. How do you actually come about it? Information coming in from everywhere. But for a lot of us that are designers and draftsmen, if we're being asked to say design a boat, we've already got it in our head what that boat's going to be roughly. And we can start to individually think how different drawings are going to be done to actually prepare a full set of plans that will create that boat. When we're documenting a boat, we certainly need photographs and that other, and other information, which we'll come to in a moment when we look at a couple of these other drawings here. But this drawing here is a good drawing to start with because when we are designing a boat, we do sketches, we do rough drawings of it, we do slightly better ones, but we're always coming back to what is the basic shape of this boat? And the shape is called a lines plan. And that's one of the trickier plans for people to understand and one of the very tricky plans to draw by hand because what you've got to do is draw the boat looking at it side on, looking down on the boat and looking at sections through the boat. So you start off with a grid. 
you start off with these lines running across the plan and these ones running up and down the plan and the same here plan lines running across and running up and down and they're often on the back of a clear sheet so you can draw all this outline on the top and erase it and move it around without rubbing around your grid but the very first grid line you'll put down is the center line the boat will have a center line you only have to draw one half of it and then you'll draw another line through here which is about where it's going to float the water line and then you'll draw start to draw them as the actual shape of what they are the outline of the boat in what it looks like side on will be drawn in and you might be changing this later on but you'll draw something in as a starting point then you'll draw an outline of what it looks like looking down on it and then one of the first lines you might even draw is how you think this waterline shape coming through here is going to look like. And that's that line side on there. Well, what does that look like when you're looking down on it? Then you actually go to a section and say, well, well I know I've got a point here. I know I've got a point here. And I know I've got a point down the bottom I've got to get to. The point there on the profile is the point up here on the waterline it's that point here and then down the bottom we've got this part across here so we join them up and I'm really simplifying things a lot here but we've created a section and then we keep working through the plan going from one view to another gradually putting more of these lines in more of these more of these lines along here till we've created this shape when you look down on this lines plan you're looking at contours Contour is a mountain. When you're looking at this plan at the bottom here, you're looking at these cross sections. What does the shape look like and how does it change? And when you're looking at it side on, you've even got lines through here that are helping you show how some of this shape is developed. Now, we want to talk about that anymore. Or we'll be on this for 10 minutes and we haven't got long. But that's how you create a lines plan. And you do a lot of rubbing out. That's for sure. But the next plan you're going to need is the structure. And again, some of that is calculation. Some of it's things that you know that you've done before. But you know you have a rough outline in your head of where things are going to be. On this boat, we knew where the lead was going to be, where the bottom of the boat at the end of either end had to be created with wood. We had a major piece of structure through here that forms the center line. And then we had parts off it, floors, across here that are holding the sides together and the planking and then this boat was very simple it just had a couple of four and a half pieces that the planking was attached to but the planking was done in three layers which makes it a little bit more complicated to look at but essentially what I've done is drawn out the bits on the middle that are often the first parts that are made when you're building the boat and then added in the other parts as the boat's getting built so you build the structure on the plan. You actually create the story of the plan. It's the story of how the boat's going to be built. You're building that structure. You're building various parts of it and drawing them on there and going backwards and forwards again between the different views as to where things are going to line up, how's it going to fit with the layout that you've come up with, how's it, what size are these pieces going to build so you can actually do it in a way that you can understand the um the structure properly and everything is the right um, thickness and so on but what i've shown you here is a perspective which might help you get your head around that earlier drawing there's the structure of the boat with those three different views but if you combine the views you do get this perspective so running around this little bit of line here and up here was actually part of a cross section of the boat that we were looking at the side view where you could see all that center line structure is showing up here. And then the planking, which is coming out and going around the boat, that's showing up in these lines here. And the three layers of it are shown here. One layer running in one direction around the hull, another layer done in individual planks going across the hull the other way. And the last layer of planks, these individual ones, are running from here all the way up to the, the end. And when you pull all those bits together and fasten them together, you've got a very thick, strong shell, which goes back to, to this drawing here. That's part of the planking going one way. 
behind it is the planking going the other way. And on the outside behind that is the planking going fore and aft. All that's there showing how it's built and it helps you determine the thickness of all those pieces. The other thing you've got to draw often is a plan for the rig for a sailing boat. And that's shown here with this rig plan for Kathleen, which has got a lot of detail in it, showing the different spars, how far deep they go down into the boat, the sails, all the lines that are used to actually pull the sail up, set it and control it. And then the stays, the different um, lines, these ones here that hold the mast up. And by doing these drawings, you can then actually determine how big those structures have to actually have to be because you've got various lengths and angles that then by applying a certain load to the things, you do a calculation that will tell you the mast needs to be this diameter, these shrouds need to be this particular diameter. But you've got to do the drawing first to then work out the structure and then go back to the drawing and draw them correctly to scale. So how do you draw a plan? Technically, you're using a lot of pencil. That's what I've done by hand. And sometimes you'll ink it in later. But again, with this plan, I had to draw the waterline down to give me and the cross-section lines to be able to draw the outline of where all that went, where the shape was, to then put the masts in and then determine how that rigging was going to be set up and help them figure out some calculations, whether the mast diameter was going to be right, or whether the shroud positions and the shroud diameters were going to be right. So it involves rubbing things out, it involves making decisions and changing things, and it can involve starting the whole plan again if you've made a major change. And that's where drawing plans is a thing that requires a lot of patience. Um, that's one of the things that you need to have as a draftsman is patience to be able to do that. Now, I can imagine that. Uh, could you, like, this is a, a quick um, question uh, in between, but how long did it take you to do a plan like that? Uh, so are we talking about days or weeks? If we go back to a drawing like this, created for a boat that's from scratch, it would spread itself out over a couple of weeks of drawing individually, the number of hours it would take would spread themselves out to perhaps take two days worth of drawing, two or three days. And you need to add into that some of the time you might have spent calculating how thick certain things should be. When I'm documenting a boat, you need to add in the hours that are spent going back to the boat mm. to um, work further, work more information out. It's often a good idea to draw the basic parts in that you know and then go and draw in the bits that are missing or the bits that seem to be wrong and redetermine it. And they're all hours that need to be calculated into preparing a plan. It's not just drawing it and drawing it once. No. It can be drawing it and then coming back and realising, actually, this piece is longer than what I thought it was. Um, I've got to redraw that or I've worked out something else about it and I've got to make it different again. It is a, a circular process and your basic tools are a sheet of clear film. Drafting film is the best thing to draw it on. A pencil, and I draw all my plans in 5H, the hardest ledge you can get, so you can get mm -hmm. a very fine, sharp line to it. And you often draw the line in softly to begin with until you're sure that that's where it's going to end up and then you can go back over it and draw it in. You have a rubber. But you also, there's a lot of curved lines. And that's one of the tricks with boats. We have what we call splines, thin sheets, thin little pieces of plastic, long, thin bits of plastic. And we have lead weights that we can hold the plastic down. And that will then help create this line all the way through here by holding the batten down to that shape and then drawing the pencil along next to it. The same with the um, outline for the hull. Um, the deck plan and so on. That's how you do it. So you need those basic things and you need a big drawing board because some of these drawings measure over a metre long mm -hmm. and um, almost a metre wide so that you could draw it to a big enough scale and draw everything in there. 
Now, um, for me as a lay person, all of these plans look pretty different. Um, uh, when you where when you're tasked with drawing a plan, for instance, when you were tasked to draw these for the museums, mm -hmm. did the people um, giving you the job had specific usage scenarios in in their mind for each of one, or is it sometimes that you just draw generalist plans that are just useful in any way? Um, because I'm wondering when you would draw this plan or that plan. How did you use a ship's plan is a really good question. And this one answers all those questions, I think. It's another drawing I've done where there's a lot of information on one drawing and it could be used for a number of different things. What we were tasked with here, and there's an awful lot of thumbprints on this one I can see straight away, was recreating the vessel crate, which is in the museum's fleet, but also belongs to the War Memorial Museum in Canberra. We had to draw a plan of what existed and then come up with a layout of how this vessel was laid out and used in World War II as a, command vessel, a commando vessel. And we also had to draw a lot of structure in terms of figure out how it was actually going to be built, how the people were going to build it. So in a way, it was like a plan if this boat, which was a, simply a fishing boat, was going to be built by scratch. The first thing we did was determine a lot of this structure that existed, where it was, where it sat, so that we could put in all this arrangement and strong structural things called bulkheads and other parts um, correctly for the boat to actually be rebuilt, but also to interpret its story correctly. So what, again, the very first thing I did for this plan, as I said, was to sit down with another fellow who sadly passed away. The two of us worked out how the boat was put together and I drew it up as a drawing then we had to sit down and work out where these particular bulkheads were going to go and come up with an arrangement that fitted what we knew the boat was laid out like, where the engine fitted, um, various other bits and pieces. So it was a combination of when you're using a boat, of building the boat as well as documenting the boat and restoring the boat. So if this was a plan for the people to build the boat originally, it would have had all that information on and the boat builder can then know from his practice reading off the plan which bits to lay down first where they're going to go and how to build the rest of it around it this plan was used with some of that structure in place but we had to do a lot of restoration work on had to take a lot of things off that didn't exist and start again so when the builders who were doing that had this basically shell of the boat to work out, to, to work with. They also had my plan here of how the deck was laid out to put the new deck down, where the hatches should be, where these bulkheads that are drawn here in these cross sections were, how they were going to be attached to the frames. All the information that if they'd been building this boat as a fishing boat originally, they would have needed anyway, was on the plan. It's just that they were lucky enough to start with a lot of centerline material, all the planking and all these frames in place. They just had to repair various things. So that's how this plan was used. I got a lot of information on there in one go. And then I actually did draw a number of separate plans of how this was laid out, how the fuel tanks were done. There's dotted in bits and pieces here about extra tanks that were put on the back of the deck. Uh, there's other information, even the dinghy. I designed a dinghy for them from scratch because when they took this boat on the commando raid, they actually pinched someone's dinghy up in Cairns and took it with them on the boat. And uh, I don't know if they ever promised to bring it back. But we decided, well, we couldn't go up to Cairns and pinch another dinghy. So I drew a plan and the shipwright built the dinghy and the dinghy's down there with the, the vessel itself. So how do you use a plan? Well, you use it to build a boat. You can be commissioned to draw a set of plans to build a boat, and that can be a set of 10 plans, 20 plans, even a lot more than that if the boat has a lot of detail and so on. It could be used for restoration. Once you've got an existing boat, you can draw what's there that's correct, 
and draw in what needs to be fixed, what needs to be added, what needs to be new, what needs to be different. Um, you can then use it just to document the boat, to record what the boat is, if in case the boat is lost, but also to be able to explain that boat in books and in presentations like this, in fact. If you've got it documented as a plan, you've actually basically saved the boat, even if, if somewhere down the track the actual physical item was lost, you've at least recorded everything and you could build a new one if you wanted to or just keep that as documentation to show it existed. But the other thing that this plan's been used a lot for is for building models. Many, many people have wanted to build a model of Crate. It's such a significant boat. Its story is so amazing. They took this boat a thousand miles into enemy territory in Singapore Harbour, sank a number of Japanese cargo ships, about seven of them, um, in nineteen in early nineteen the nineteen forties in the early part of World War One, and then they escaped. They took commandos who paddled kayaks the last twenty five kilometers to Singapore Harbour, and then they picked those people up and their kayaks and brought them back safely to Western Australia. And the Japanese had no idea how this raid had been done. That's a very significant story. And it's no wonder that lots of people want to make models of it. So they've, they've taken this plan. It's got enough information on it for a model maker to actually build it. He can work out what the profile of it looks like. He knows what it looks like looking down on it. And he's got a number of cross sections here to give him the shape. And he's got all the details that if he wants to build the, the control room, which was one of the old fishing boat fishing holes, he can build that. He can do the wheelhouse up here. He can build all the tanks and things down the back. He can put the gardener engine in if he wants to. All these bits and pieces are there. So that's this is a plan I'm really pleased that um, I did because it didn't just restore a boat. It actually um, helped a lot of people make models and it helped us restore it really accurately because when I did it, the one surviving member of that commando, the 14 commandos that did it, he was still alive. So I could go and talk to him and say, I found out all these things from the boat and I think they go here, here and here. What do you remember? And he was able to say, well, some of these things I remember, but some of them I don't. But the way you've drawn it looks right. So let's agree that that's right. And everything there is, is as correct as we can make it. So you go ahead. And if you've got any questions, keep asking. And that's what I did. And it was a pleasure to be able to reproduce that boat the way that it was. So that you can get the feel of the boat, not just from the drawing, but by actually being on it, you can feel what it was like. So that's how a plan is used for a variety of different things. Well, in a way, you, it's a document of sealing it into history. I mean, that's how I, I as a historian, would say it, that other people can um, then go back to it, look at it, even regardless if the boat still exists, um, and use that for whatever they want. But would they need uh, the skill of uh, a draftsman like you uh, to really understand the plan? Uh, or are there plans that even I could read without explanation? Um, <laughs> it helps to be a draftsman and designer because you can almost see instantly, as I said, you can look at the plan and start to move it around in your head. But once you know the story of the boat and start to think about things, I think you could start to do that too. Um, on this drawing, for well, actually, it's a good one to go to when we start to look at questions in a minute. This is a flood boat and it's got a number of bits and pieces um, all on one simple plan to record it, to document it. It's got how the boat was built with the structure across it here. It's got how the boat was laid out with the thwarts that people sat on because this is a rowing boat, a flood boat. It's got the trolley that was on, that was sat on to be launched from. And once you see all those in this, this is actually a plan, a very formal drawing, but I filled all the details in. It also gave me the opportunity to draw a horse because the horse was vital to the whole thing. Without the horse, that boat could not be launched. It had to be dragged out of the shed. It was too heavy for anyone else, for people to move it. 
the horse would drag it out on the trolley down to the floodwaters, which being a flood wasn't very far away by that point, and they could launch it. And they had oars to row it with and a rudder to put on the back to steer it with. But you can look at this drawing here and start to visualize, oh yeah, there's the, the trolley. And when you go back to drawing, you can see the axle and the little supports for it. And this is the part that goes over the horse. That's the, um, the harness part for it there. So if you start to understand that story, you can start to see what's in the drawing and start to visualize it yourself again. And then by drawing this and shading it in, I've given depth to it. You can see how the planking runs. You can see how it sits on the trolley. You can see relatively how big it is to a person and to a draft horse. So a whole lot of things are there once you start to put more information on the drawing. So sometimes if the drawing's got a lot of information on it, it'll help you read it. But sometimes just a simple drawing is much easier to read and you start to work your way around it. Um, yeah, thank you, David. And um, I agree, I think um, we can slowly uh, wander over to questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions, just put them into Q&A. We actually have questions already recorded. And I'm going to uh, answer the first one from Peter, uh, who writes, well done, Roland and David. Uh, one of the sort of plans that I've been seeing are as built with revisions and additions added as details. Is there anything special about those sorts of plans compared with the process you've described? Ah, the as-built drawing. That was a classic thing. Whenever you've built a boat from a set of plans, it's often a good idea for the person that's designed it to go back and look at how those plans are interpreted because sometimes people will change their mind, the builder will, and move something around and not tell you that he's done something differently. Or you may have been very vague with the dimension that you put on the plan and they've finally decided what it's going to be themselves. So you go back over the, the, the ship, the vessel, and do what's called an as-built drawing where you take your existing drawing and go into the boat and look at where everything is and tick things off and say, yes, that's all in the right place, but no, they've moved that. Or yes, we decided to do that, but we never got back to the plan to rub it out. Um, I can remember my uncle who I worked for telling me to, um, when you do those sorts of things, don't take your tape measure with you. Just go and eyeball it all off. You'll, otherwise you'll go mad because all you're doing is recording things that have moved and you can look at the drawing because you've been doing things enough to know that, yes, that's moved six inches or that's moved three feet or whatever it was because we used to do things in Imperials and a long time ago, but it's moved whatever it is in metric terms. And you just know from the drawing, well, that means it's over here on that scale and you draw it in in red on, a, on the copy of the plan and that's near enough. That's just at least recorded what actually happened as against what was there. And I guess a lot of as-built drawings end up just with a lot of details. If there's some huge major changes, then I'd like to think that whoever was designing it went back and redrew the plan according to the major changes before things went too far, because those major changes could impact on a whole lot of other decisions you've made um, earlier on. And they might be minor impacts or they could be major impacts. And you want to actually understand that before they get too far. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, um, oh, well, Peter can say if that really answers his question. Uh, I have another one uh, that I personally have been wondering about, and I've mentioned that earlier, um, uh, to uh, an, an interested onlooker, plans look like a very, uh, well, they look like engineering, uh, very detailed, very uh, structured and very organized. Um, but also look like art. So, and if you draw a plan, if you go to a boat that already exists, or if you design one, where does really engineering end and where does art begin? What, uh, how much intuition is there in, in these plans and how much um, um, uh, like hard mathematical measuring 
um, is taking place and do these ever conflict? Well, that's a really good question to ask. And um, it's one that I've lived with my whole life because a lot of boat design is, gee, I really like the shape and the look of that and the way it sort of flows and things like that. But it's actually got to work in a practical way. So it's a blend of the two. And there's never really a stop and starting point. There's no kind of interface between I stop engineering here and I start being an artist here. The two are going through your head at the same time. Some of the engineering is often done by feel, or you've got a good feel to begin with as to what it's going to be. And you know when you do the calculation, what you've drawn or what you're thinking of is going to be very close to what you've sketched out. But other things do require a set of calculations. You've actually, one of the key things in designing a boat, when you go back to the lines plan of the boat, and we'll skip back a few slides then, go back to that one, all this volume under the boat here has to actually be the right amount of volume to support the boat or it won't float correctly. And that's a calculation you've got to do in two ways. You've got to work out how much the boat's going to weigh or get a good estimate of it. And then you've got to work out how much volume you've got under the boat. And those two actually have to equal each other. You have to have enough volume that will support that weight. Um, if I take it too much further, we'll lose everyone. But that's one of the things you've got to do. And there's a way of working out the weight of the boat that's very tedious. It's almost accounting. You do a weight estimate. You do a, a structure of the boat and work out how much each piece is going to weigh approximately and add it all up. That can take a couple of days of figuring. And some of it is estimates and some of it is known facts. And then the shape of the boat is another calculation by hand that takes an hour or two to do. And there are simpler ways of doing it. Once you've been designing boats for a little while, you can often get to a lot of these points very quickly because you're working from something that exists. So a lot of the engineering things can be answered fairly on early on with reasonable accuracy, but you want to get the shape right, you want to get the feel of it right, and you start to blend those two together. So it's definitely a balance of that. And it almost comes down to some things, if it looks right, feels right, then it probably is right. More correctly, sometimes if it looks wrong, that makes you think, have I actually done this correctly? Is the calculation, should I recalculate this? Something's not working here. So it's definitely a, a blend. And it's a known, it's, it's, it's something that often people have said about yacht design. It's one of the really big bits of vessel design where art and engineering are blended together. And some designers were much more artists than they were engineers. It didn't necessarily mean their boats were poorly constructed, but they put a lot more effort into the shape of the thing and what it looked like. And someone else sometimes often helped them figure out how it was going to work as a structure. Wow. Um, it's, it's definitely one of the joys of being a yacht designer is being able to balance those two things together and get it, get it right, get it to work. I think the next question we have actually builds up on that a little bit or references it a little bit. Um, uh, the, uh, the question is, aficionados seem to be able to look at a plan and see or feel how the boat will move through the water. Do you have any tips on this or is it just down to lots of experience? <laughs> that was going to be my tip. It's experience. And I could probably design boats better as I got older because I had a lot more experience and I'd sailed a lot of things and because I did a lot of sailing boat design and I kind of knew how things would work. But this plan here, this boat actually is a really good example of, of answering that question of experience because when we restored Akarana, we had to get the right amount of lead, this lump of lead, correct for the boat to sail properly because it wasn't correct. Um, it had changed too much and there were some serious things wrong. That's five tonnes of lead and it was only sailing with about three and that's a significant difference and it wasn't sailing properly. So one of my jobs was to figure that out. 
But what I did with the museum before I did it was I took them sailing on another similar boat and said, this is how the boat should feel when we go sailing. It's going to heel over a lot, but then it's going to stop and it's going to sail beautifully. When we sail Akarana at the moment, it heels over a lot and it feels like it's going to heel over a lot more and tip over on its side. And that is exactly what's going to happen until we get five tonnes of lead under there. So you've got to trust me that this is going to, the feel of what we're now is what I'm going to reproduce when I do this and that I'm confident that that will be the right amount of lead and that's where it's got to go and everything's going to work itself out. And it did. But if I didn't have that feel, I would have had a lot of more difficulty doing this and getting that right and feeling, yes, I'm comfortable with what the answer is and that's actually is going to work. I mean, that also ties into my next question. I'm pretty sure we have a lot of people in the audience that are now saying, wow, this is amazing. I want to draw a ship's plan. So how do you learn it, especially these days? I, I know you mentioned that you worked with your uncle. Um, uh, what, is, what is the background of people who do draw these plans? And what do you think would you have to do to, to learn how to do it today? Right. Let's start with the formal side of it. Um, and then we'll get to my story, which is the informal side of it. <laughs> you can go to university. You can study naval architecture, which is actually a branch of engineering, as against house design or civil architecture is its own separate thing, and then engineers help build the thing that the architects designed. Naval architects learn how to do the engineering and the, the shape of the boat as well at the same time. So they do it all. And that will teach you all the formal processes of how to do the drawing, how to do the calculations, all sorts of things like that. And it will teach you these days how to do it on a computer. I cannot design a boat on a computer. I was brought up to design boats by pencil. And I was brought up in a way that I actually taught myself. Because one of the other ways you could learn design, and you could still probably do it, is there were books published on yacht design. And it showed you some of the techniques and some of the formal things and how to do it. So I taught myself to design a small boat that I raced on, a thing called a 12-foot skiff. And that meant the plans were fairly simple. There was a lot to it. It's only 12 foot long, um, you know, 3.6, 3.7 meters, whatever it is long. And there was not a lot of structure in it. But it gave you the basics. And then I started to work on slightly bigger boats. And then I started to work for my uncle. And I learned as I went along how to do various things. But you can learn about it formally or you can look those things up in the books and they'll teach you how to do it. But if you're learning it informally like I did, it really hits home very quickly how you do these things because one of the best ways to learn things is to make mistakes. And trying to draw things up initially, it wasn't happening and I had to look things up again and work it out. But then it really stuck in your head how to do it rather than being formally told, if you do this, this, and this, it'll come out. If you learn it by doing it in a practical way, it sticks with you a lot more. Um, I guess I had a balance there. There were things that were properly taught to me formally by my uncle and other people that I worked for, but there are other things I just figured out. And then because I was working by myself a lot of the time, had to think out, how do you actually get the answer to that? How do you figure that bit of the drawing out or what's that calculation going to be? What's the best way to do it? And you'd look it up or ask someone and gradually work things out. It's a combination. Um, I think we don't have any big questions anymore in the um, Q&A. Um, so we can almost wrap it up, but I have, uh, oh, there's another one. Um, have you ever had to draw a plan of a vessel from maritime archaeology evidence? A uh, vessel that's sunk and you've yeah. never seen before. Um, I don't think I have. I've looked at drawings where people have determined what the thing is from what's described. But I can tell you an interesting story there. Part of my background is an ability to build Aboriginal bark canoes of a certain type. And the only way I could figure that out was 
archaeological evidence, which was where colonists had described how these boats were built from a sheet of bark in very basic form. So what I did was make a model from a small piece of bark and figure out how it actually would work. And finally, it came up as exactly the sort of shape that they were describing and their early sketches showed. So that was a physical way of determining it rather than a drawing way. I didn't draw anything. I just started to know roughly what the proportions would be to get it to come out right, played around with it, and then came up with a shape. Then I did a drawing. It wasn't until I'd built the thing that I'd done, that, done it. But there are some really good examples of boats that have been built where all they've had is documentary evidence of what it has, what it was, but they know that physically it's got to do certain things, and they go back through the same process, I guess. Of it's going to be built out of these materials. It's going to look roughly like this. Let's draw something out, do some calculations, and see if that works. See where we sit. Have we got to make this boat bigger for it to float? For example, have we got to put more things in there for it to hold together? I guess they would then start to try and keep to what they've got in front of them that shows the information they've got, but then create a design built with that basic information um, to make it work. And then maybe even make a model and see if that works or else, fingers crossed, make a full-size version and see how that works as well. Mm. And that might teach them a lot that they've actually got to go through it all again to get it right. It would be a big challenge um, computers would help you solve some of those problems and not have to build one now before you finally built one. Mm. But it would be an interesting challenge, and I'd certainly be interested in taking it on if it ever happened. Um, I think we're almost finished. And there's one question, um, which is okay if you can't answer it, um, David. One of the oldest discussions, especially in history, is... Uh, the idea that uh, something that is beautiful works better, uh, that something that is aesthetic has a certain design um, quality to it, um, that means that it's also more functional. Now, is your experience when you look back at drawing the plans of all of these boats, that the boats that are physically, aesthetically pleasing for you as a, someone who draws them are also efficient, good boats? And then things that you look at and say, oh, this looks wrong or ugly or not very pleasing, that these boats are, well, not very functional? Or is that not something that you experience could like, uh, answer? Yeah. It's not an easy one to answer in a short way. A lot of the boats I've designed, I'm really happy with the, lay the way they look, the beauty of them but I'm also very happy with how everything else has come together to create that shape. And there's beauty in that, just in the process of getting it right and looking back at the structure and everything looks nice and even and what have you. Um, and you, and then you look at things where it's all a bit awkward and think, no, that's not right. And I've seen that sometimes when you're trying to get that whole shape right, those lines, if they flow nicely from one end to the other, if those cross sections just gradually change um, as it opens up, for example, here, it starts off steep and just gradually changes and works its way through, gradually moves to here in a nice even pattern. And these lines, they just flow beautifully like that. Yeah, that, that gives you a sense of confidence that the boat will work really well and that you've thought it out. And for water to flow, it needs to flow over something that's nice and smooth and beautiful as well. So that kind of does force things to happen that way. And I think we could look at ships where they're very square and so on. They're actually probably not a very efficient shape, but it's efficient in terms of carrying its cargo, and they put up with the fact that it's inefficient in terms of its resistance. And we can take that further because I've documented some really interesting vessels from um, New Guinea that were sort of cargo sailing boats of their period, traditional things, that they look beautiful and they have a beautiful shape to them, 
and they're very efficient. It's just that they don't carry a lot of cargo, but they've balanced it out because they know the boat's got to be efficient to sail. They can't just put a bigger engine in it. And the ship people get around it sometimes by, I'll just put a bigger engine in there and we'll push it through the water no matter what. And it doesn't look so beautiful. So I suspect your correspondent, your questioner might be saying, those ghastly car carrying ships that go around look awful. They get by because they've got a big enough engine and they can push them through the water, but they don't look very beautiful. Whereas some of the the older liners, the older Queen Marys and things like that looked beautiful and were efficient at the same time. There was a time when you could do that. Well, and when you had to. David, yeah. thank you very much. That was amazing. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you, everybody who was listening. Thank you, everybody who helped organize this uh, Beneath the First Surface talk, especially Sophie and also all the others. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, David put in the panel, uh, the slide for the next one on uh, uh, 28th of November. You will uh, see a great talk about reinterpreting and conserving the Cape Bowling Green Lighthouse, a lighthouse you can see here in the museum. Our conservator, Nick Flood, and our curator, Inga Scheel, we talk about the history of the Bowling Green Lighthouse, but also um, how do you conserve something, such a large structure that has been transported to Sydney and is now um, uh, being um, conserved and cared for by the museum. So I hope you to see you there. And uh, thanks for all the questions and have a nice evening. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's been great to be there. And I'll give you a plug. That's my drawing I did of the lighthouse to figure out how it was put together. Fantastic. You can see that it looks very aesthetically pleasing. It was a lovely project, that. <laughs> Thank you, okay, Roland. Then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.